Our next segment is called The Adopted Son of the City. Here's something I didn't know. Ray Bradbury wasn't born in LA. I thought he was. I, like, he's he, so well regarded as like he's one of the greatest authors of Los Angeles. I'm going to say he's from Wisconsin. Ray Bradbury was born on the distant planet of Waukegan, which is in the state of Illinois, an industrial suburb Wisconsin. north of Chicago. Uh, hometown uh, of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Jack Benny, patron saint of touching your own face. Ray <laughs> Bradbury comes from one His of those... His humor has not aged well. <laughs> <laughs> Ray Bradbury comes from one of those white families where it can be traced hundreds of years. His lineage goes back to 1630 in Salisbury, Massachusetts. A real, a real uh, John Carter family. <laughs> when they settled after escaping from jolly old England. Not so jolly old England after they left. Ray was born in August of 1920. He came from a humble working class background. One online biography said his father worked as a lineman for phone and power utilities and his mother was an immigrant from Sweden. That's not a job. <laughs> uh, his mother Esther had been raised in the States since she was three years old so kind of isn't the same thing as your occupation being an immigrant. Mm -hmm. But whatever. Yeah. Wait, you say you think it's easy being an immigrant? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? It's a lot of hard work. We got it. Right, audience? Am I right? Audience full of immigrants? Have they pulled? <laughs> they're all applauding in <laughs> the way that they do in their country, <laughs> which is silently. His maternal side of the family worked in iron and steel. His paternal worked in printing and attempted to get rich in gold and silver mining and lost it all. He grew up knowing his family history was rich with follies and quiet successes. Ray was one of four not siblings. With, not rich in money. Uh, rich in stories. Um, <laughs> it's different. Ray was one of four siblings, a pair of twins, an older sister, and himself. But by 1927, two of his siblings died. One of the twins, Samuel, died during the flu epidemic of 1918 oh when he was two years old and later his sister Betty Jane died of pneumonia when Ray was seven. Get out of Chicago. These deaths along with the whimsy of his childhood would shape the life and storytelling for the rest of his life because that's his story. It's like kind of painful but kind of whimsical. <laughs> it's yeah. like dark yeah. whimsy. Yeah. That's wistful. Wistful. Thank wistful you. but for fun kids. <laughs> like he has stories growing up where him and his brother like somebody had in town told him the world was going to end on this day so him and his brother packed like a lunch and went out to a rock and waited for the world to end when he was like a teenager i think 15 he watched a car hit a pole he watched and he, like four people died and he, <laughs> he saw that like it's that stuff that's really dark but also there's like yeah, a, that's how you get a ray bradbury that's how you get a ray bradbury yeah. but he also saw a really cute dog yeah, exactly beforehand. he also ate a really good ice cream one day <laughs> and he had to immortalize <laughs> that that soda jerk but now let's get into the whimsy by all accounts he seemed to have an idyllic childhood in a small town north of a big city as an adult he claimed to have an almost perfect recall of his childhood even his birth <laughs> Says, uh, what? He says he remembered everything. Also, a weird thing that I wrote down that reminded me of you. Uh, his mother said he had a weird eating habit. Would only eat, for a long time, would only eat milk, hamburgers, and tomato soup. Come on. That was never me. <laughs> did he keep anything in his pockets? <laughs> How much soup did he keep in his pocket? That's way more than I would ever. Did he invent the lining that I now use to keep soup in my pocket? It's, it's heated, but it won't burn my legs. <laughs> At eight years old, everything changes when a lodger at his grandma's boarding house brought the first copy of Amazing Stories when he was eight years old. That same year, Buck Rogers comic strips start and he starts collecting them. A couple years later, Tarzan comics start getting printed in color. Around that time, he began reading fervently with things like the wonderful world of Oz and Grimm's fairy tales sticking mm -hmm. out to him. Two huge influences in his early years was his grandmother who would watch movies with him every week with a particular emphasis on Lon Chaney and the husband of our eternal mayor, Mary Pickford. They watched a lot of Douglas Fairbanks movies together. He recalls being three and five respectively when he saw The Phantom of the Opera and The Hunchback of Notre Dame in the theaters with his grandmother. Mm -hmm. The other influences was his aunt Nevada or Neva who was a costume designer and a dress maker who would take Ray to the plays and always encourage him to use his imagination. But what do you what to do with this imagination <laughs> business? Imagine? No money in that. Luckily something monetary this way comes in 1932 at the age of 12 <laughs> Ray Bradbury goes to a carnival and watches a show from a magician called Mr. Electrico at the show Mr. Electrico was covered in static electricity and he found Bradbury in the crowd and he approached I heard that he approached him I also heard that he was sitting down in an electric chair <laughs> um, but as part of the show he touched Ray's nose and said oh no don't do that these days it was a, a lower nose no <laughs> um, he touches Ray Bradbury's nose and says live forever and Bradbury said and I decided I would <laughs> and he always has my life came together then with Mr. Electrico telling me to live forever I want to give you the same spark Mr. Electrico gave to me he would tell a Cerritos high school crowd <laughs> 
And that's a binding contract. <laughs> this instance charged Ray Bradbury's imagination. He came back the next day and asked Mr. Electrical for advice on a magic trick because, of course, Ray Bradbury was also into magic because how else can he be like Daniel? Hey, come on. I'm not from the Midwest. <laughs> that's what I've got a hard edge. <laughs> There's something about me that I've, is my, rugged. My whimsy is urban. rugged. I've got urban whimsy. <laughs> urban whimsy, which is just like smog inhalation. <laughs> and he found Mr. Electrical and they talked and Mr. Electrical took him to other carnival performers and Mr. Electrical told Ray that he was a reincarnation of his best friend who died in World War One, the mustard gas trench war that that one. Bradbury said after that a few days later I began to write full time. I've written every <laughs> single day of my life since that day. What how old was he? Twelve? Really? Yeah. Wow, yeah, your people definitely got started young. Yeah, for sure. We're like, and I they, read a Tarzan, and I'm going to do this forever. And wait a minute, they liked writing? <laughs> they liked whatever they, drug they were addicted to, so they kept They liked writing? the money <laughs> of writing, you mean. How lucrative it was. Two years later, 1934, the Bradbury family moves. First to Arizona for a bit, and then per more permanently to Los Angeles. I, again, cannot for the life of me figure out where they moved first. It wasn't the famous ha house in Cheviot Hills, but at some point they moved a couple times. I can't figure out where. He was now 14 in Los Angeles, home of Hollywood, California, where a different kind of magic happened. Cocaine magic. No. Oh, no. <laughs> Bradbury attended oh, Berendo yeah. Junior High School in the outskirts of downtown near Olympic. Berendo has such alumnus as Mamie Van Doren, Jimmy Doolittle, and Edgar Bergen, a famous ventriloquist. So now he's at school. He's living in Los Angeles. He bums around libraries in town. He's got a job selling newspapers, which is the, the Los Angeles Daily News, to be exact, at the corner of Olympic and Norton, again, to be exact. And around this time, he starts attending plays because that's what he would do back home with Aunt Neva. He's a frequent at the Figueroa Street Playhouse, which is now the Variety Arts theater in downtown and while he's frequently the figueroa street playhouse he lands his first job do you know what his first job was working in the library his, I, first, well, his, him... his first writing job wait a minute if he's a copy of me was it working at linens and things <laughs> <laughs> hiding in linens and things and collecting a paycheck for doing no work i shelved some things i shelved some towels another very daniel thing his first writing job was writing a joke for george burns for the gracie and allen show really yeah wow how did he get that I'll, we'll get to that here's the bit gracie goes Oh, and George is like, quick, somebody, Gracie has fainted. Hurry, bring a glass of water. Gracie, can't you say something? And Gracie says, sure, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. And then the music plays, which is better than any intro we've ever written. But hang on, what was Act 2 like? Nah, did she eat a funny thing? The theme song started playing, but then it got interrupted. Yeah, it gets and interrupted then, again. And then what mythical creature nah. then came and interrupted uh, Griffin that. comes. He had gotten to know George and Gracie and had started giving amateur scripts to them every Wednesday for consideration. Because they would also frequent the same playhouse, so he'd run into them. Because I guess they were broadcasting the radio show from there. So he would just run into them. This is, you know, we, we joked about like... Like, why would Lee Brackett run into Edgar Rice Burroughs? Well, Raymond... R Raymond Raymond Bradbury yeah Raymond Bradbury <laughs> would run into Gra uh, George Gracie Burns Allen. and Gracie Allen just going to the theater so yeah he'd gotten to know them he'd start giving them amateur scripts to them every Wednesday for consideration somehow this was the winner after Brendo he attended Los Angeles High School which is on Olympic in Mid-City there you could find Ray and of course the drama club where he hoped to one day be an actor he was also writing still writing every day and reading anything he could get his mitts on at this point collecting all the Prince Valiant's comics he also had a real admiration for Thomas Wolfe and began to write poetry mm -hmm. he had two dedicated teachers who were his only instruction in as, far, as far as writing. He saved up his lunch money to buy a typewriter. He wrote bylines for the school paper on live performances by Jack Benny and Fred Allen. This was his life in high school. Not only just like a dedicated writer, but a dedicated comedy fan. Yeah, I, I think about that a lot. He's kind of funny. Yeah. Like, not like hard-hitting funny, but he's... I mean, yeah, it's funny when a kid licks an ice cream cone and it falls on the floor, yeah, which that... is the recurring joke. <laughs> so sentimental. Very sentimental. Yeah. Very amber-tinted. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it was the greatest summer ever. And then like a lady died. And that's why it was the greatest. <laughs> I got away with it. In 1936, the next cosmic phase begins for Ray Bradbury when he's at a secondhand bookstore in Hollywood and sees a handbill promoting a meeting for the LASFS, the Los Angeles Science mm. Fantasy Society. Mm. Once again, we talk about them a little bit little bit more when we talk about Force Ackerman and monsters and the nerds who love them. Uncle Forey, Nerd Zero, and weirdly enough, the grandson of the architect behind the Bradbury building, no relation, had <laughs> created a group of science fiction enthusiasts who would meet on the second floor of Clifton's Cafeteria. Clifton's Cafeteria. Clifton's Laffeteria. Uh, that funny Ray Raymond. 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 I keep calling him Raymond Bradbury. Raymond Bur Bradbury. He joined the group which met every Thursday and would join the ranks of such beautiful nerds as, again, Kuttner, Highland, Brackett, and... 
Outrun Hubbard. The oh, members yeah. really took a liking to Bradbury that. and encouraged him to keep writing, which of course he did. So he graduates high school in 1938 and he keeps writing. He does not pursue college. He is luckily not sent to the military at the dawn of World War II because his eyesight is atrocious. It has been since he was yeah, like this guy is me. 13. So he stays well, home yeah. and he... Did he, he sta- get a concussion playing hockey and then he realized he had to get glasses? Oh, it's like... <laughs> now what's this playing card read? <laughs> Hang on. Hang I on. see. Uh, uh, Johnny Carson reference. Oh! <laughs> You're attracting this dog's attention. It's going to give us coronavirus. That one? Yeah. It's it keeps cute. looking at it. It is cute. Of course it's cute. It has coronavirus. It yeah. So luckily, because his eyesight is so bad, he gets to stay home and get free limeade from Clifford Clinton as he continues to write every day and spend hours in libraries reading everything he can get his hands on. Anything he can get his hands on. He, he's like Quinn Tarantino with movies is Ray Bradbury mm-hmm. with novels mm-hmm. and poems and short stories. That turned him into two very opposite people. Yeah, for sure. Both for, like milkshakes, though. Nah, both hunch a lot. And feet. With the encouragement of his sci-fi friend, he started aiming all his writing towards pulp magazines and club fanzines. Pulp fiction. There's the connection. If, if only we didn't already use that title for another episode. This one can be called Kill. Uh, never mind. <laughs> How about the hateful mm, Hollywood? Nah, <laughs> <laughs> got it. His first short story that got published was Hollerbachin's Dilemma, which is in the League's fanzine. That was 1938, same year he got out of high school. The following year, he created his own fanzine, Future of Fantasia. Also that year, our guy Bradbury attends the first world science fiction convention in New York City. He mingles, he whines. He dines on a dime, of course. But more importantly, he networks his sci-fi editors, and from this lands his first sale to a professional science fiction magazine, Super Science Stories, which two years later would publish his story, Pendulum. And yes, he did get paid for the story. No, no, Mr. Clinton. Today I'll be buying my own limeade. <laughs> and can I also get some turkey stuffing with gravy? <laughs> Please. From Super Science Stories, he moved on to getting his short stories published in pulp magazines uh, like Weird Tales. What was beginning to emerge from his style was a superb use of metaphors and similes and the concentration on characters existing in science fiction and fantasy world. I'm telling you, all these people that we're talking about are the same person. Yeah, basically. <laughs> it just changed the names. That's the thing about Ray Bradbury that separates him from all the other pulp writers is that it was less about technology and the mechanics what? of like science fiction and and more about like people in the situation. That's exactly. That's why I'm not the biggest fan of most of Ray Bradbury stuff. Is because there's because you, know, you like the technology. I aspect. love the techno. I love the technology and like the. I don't know. Th- there's his is almost more. I- I'm thinking of something wicked this way it comes, which is yeah. not science fiction at no. all, and it's barely horror. Yeah. But like that's why I'm kind of not as into most of his stuff right. because like Arthur C. Clarke is all technology. He's like a science. He's evolution. like a scientist with a typewriter. Pretty much. And, yeah. and Arthur C. Or uh, uh, Ray, Raymond Bradbury, Raymond Bra- Bradbury. is just a heart that f- grew arms. <laughs> <laughs> is Clark your guy? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. 100%. 100%. But no question. What is, uh, what, I mean, Martian Chronicles? Martian or? Chronicles. Yeah. I really like the Martian yeah. Chronicles. And I'm I halfway remember through it right liking, now. It's really good. I remember liking Fahrenheit 451, but maybe there's too much heart in it for I, me. I never tried Fahrenheit 451 because I always knew that was a band book and I knew why what it was about, so I never tried it. <laughs> I, never, I couldn't read I could. I couldn't. I wouldn't dare. Child. I wouldn't read the Bible or Harry Potter. No, but I, in high school, read as much short stories from him as I could because somebody turned me on to the Illustrated Band, which I didn't like that short story, but like the yeah. Velt was in there, I think. And it's really good. Yeah, I, I'm not a huge fan of the illustrator. I also watched his uh, Ray Bradbury presents, which is so oh, s- uh, they're fun. <laughs> they're fun, but boy, are they sentimental. You said amber coated, very amber yeah. coated. So he's writing a different kind of sci-fi than everybody else because sci-fi changed big time when the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Had science gone too far? Who was the good guys? I thought we were the good guys. We beat fascism, but now we're burning shadows of people into walls. <laughs> are there good guys? Has science made us stray away from God or whatever? I believe in. What do we believe in now <laughs> that we're the story of the world? Twilight Zone was born in this era. And with that, I think sci-fi started telling really human stories about people making challenging decisions and science used for evil or ambivalent See, purposes. Okay, let me defend myself a little bit by saying I don't like the heart of Ray Bradbury because the, the Twilight Zone, that has a lot of heart in it also. Yeah. I don't know. The thing with Ray Bradbury is what I've read a lot just seems very sentimental yeah. and nostalgic and it doesn't do that much for me yeah i agree with you there's a lot of them that i started i'm like i just can't make through like it's just goosebumps which yeah. is fine be, be goosebumps but i'm not in the mood for goosebumps because i also thought like everything he wrote was science fiction or fantasy. yeah yeah yeah. oh yeah, yeah so, and then i picked up dandelion wine oh yeah and i'm oh, like what a... what do the are they aliens all over again this is the day of the locust where i'm going <laughs> in like here comes the lo-. like what yeah. did the da- did the aliens bring dandelion wine yeah and, and you drink cancer? it and it's, it's actually human blood yeah. is this soylent wine no, i think the short Story. story about growing up in the country. Yep. It's basically his childhood, which is like, it's a lot of bikes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was a big fan. He has a short story called The I Think Body Electric, is a, the one that ends up being the Twilight Zone episode. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of, it's the same thing. It's kind of, it's fun. Yeah, it's not my favorite. Inspired Chicken Motel. I think that's the name of it. It's sentimental, but like with a little. 
tongue in cheek, I guess. Mm -hmm. My favorite short stories from his, they're basically Twilight Zone episodes. That never became Twilight yeah. Zone episodes, and they should have been because they're both really good. Yeah. I stick with The Martian Chronicles. <laughs> Brad Baby falls into this group, and yeah, with over 600 short stories published, some are trash, just like plenty of Twilight Zone are trash, but the hey, good hey, ones are whoa, great. Whoa. I'm sure we said that earlier, but yeah. hey, hey, whoa, whoa. Hey, hey, whoa, hey, whoa, hey, whoa. Hey, now whoa. we're comparing stuff. <laughs> hey, hey, whoa, whoa. Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote over 100 things, and like four are good, but <laughs> hey, hey, whoa, whoa. Hey, hey. Whoa, whoa. This, this coronavirus <laughs> has got to go. Hey, hey. Whoa, whoa. You people in the park have got to go. But 1945, Hiroshima, Twilight Zone, we're not there yet. 1940. His life was writing feverishly, reading obsessively at the library, chatting it up about the news at the newsstand, taking acting lessons from Lorraine Day at the Wilshire Players Guild, and repeatedly watching Fantasia. The movie Fantasia. The movie Fantasia. Oh my, are you kidding me? He this watched is, that re repeatedly. I watched that movie probably every single day for like three years of my life. Really? Yeah. Do you read Bradbury? I, it's weird. I don't like Ray Bradbury that much. But I'm sure he didn't like well, Ray Bradbury much either. I also don't like myself. <laughs> <laughs> he was huh. living at Figaro and Temple. I can't, again, can't find that's out where. where. I used to <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my childhood place. And then Sundays he would spend with Lee Brackett at Muscle Beach comparing stories. Just like us? So this was his life in 1940, and it was a good life. But his writing would continue to improve, and with that, his adventure would become way more interesting. 1943 is when he establishes himself as a full-time writer, getting published in several genre magazines. In 1947, he gets a rejection notice from Weird Tales, and out of frustration, sends his story titled Homecoming to Mademoiselle. It ends up in a discard pile, but one young editorial assistant saved the story and helped get it published in the magazine. That young assistant? Truman Capote. Oh, my God. <laughs> what is this Forrest Gump of a life? I, I'd say, I was thinking the I, same I, thing. I feel like where there's so many different puzzle pieces. We're yeah. Putting, maybe I just have puzzles on the mind because that's yeah. what I've been doing for the last three days. But this is so L.A. because you're feverishly working in your hustle. You're meeting other people who are eventually going to do the same. Like you're yeah. just like, it's not networking because you're working hard. You're just meeting people. But eventually later it becomes so networking. Weird. Truman Capote. Truman Capote <laughs> runs into a group run by four sacramen. <laughs> Also in the group, a woman who would write Empire Strikes Back and the <laughs> and guy who started Scientology. A form of religion that would <laughs> ruin lives. <laughs> he writes Homecoming and it ends up winning the O. Henry Prize of 1947. Mm. When it was published, it had illustrations drawn by his pal, Charles Adams, the creator of the Adams <laughs> Family, one strip comics along with many other humorous and kind of racist illustrations. Side note, the woman who was partly responsible for the look and feel of Morticia was Charles' first wife, Barbara Jean Adams, left him and married the guy who wrote Hiroshima. Oh, yeah. Huh. It's all connected. 1947 was also the year that Bradbury got married to Marguerite McClure, who he met the year before at a bookstore. They met after she thought he was shoplifting, which fits the bill if you know what I mean. She mm -hmm. said, once I figured out he wasn't stealing books, that was it. I fell for him. <laughs> <laughs> His best man, Ray Harryhausen. Oh, my God. Right? What a life. Yeah. Okay, same year. 1947. All this stuff is happening. His short story gets published into a collection called Dark Carnival. Kind of hard to find now. A lot of it ended up in October Country, which I am a little more familiar with. He has a book on writing that I have that I like a lot. And he mentions he wrote one short story and he cried. And that's when he knew he was a great writer. I'm like, get out of here. And I rolled my eyes. See, and I read it. And it's one of the best things I've ever <laughs> written. It's called The Lake. It's really good. Yeah, if you yeah. ever stumble across a Ray Ryder's short story, The Lake, I highly suggest it. He's, this is exactly what I'm talking about, not liking. It, I want a guy who wants a paycheck and has a pregnant <laughs> wife. I want Raymond Chandler who had to be bullied into everything he ever wrote. Yeah, it's really good. It's painful but not sadistic. It packs a punch. It has a wallop of an ending but not a twist. It's his own version of Nothing in the Dark, the Twilight Zone episode. It's my suggested reading of this whole thing is The Velt and The Lake. Okay. That, you see, it's funny because at the on the Ray Bradbury Theater or whatever that yeah. show was called, the intro was that he'd lead you. He's like, welcome to my oh, boy. house. And look at these things. I can leave. Yeah. And, and, it, and one thing that always stuck out is he'd go, well, there might be a knife or a, an African velt. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he'd say at the beginning of every episode. He's such a dork. He sounds like a lazy Hitchcock. Get up. <laughs> Walk. <laughs> if such a thing is possible. <laughs> so the next book pretty much makes Bradbury Bradbury. It's another collection of intertwined short stories, and it's called, as we already discussed, The Martian Chronicles, which uh -huh. was published in 1950. This really sets him apart from his period. What's a remarkable about it? It's not a space epic. It takes place on Mars. It's not an adventure. And it's like different time periods. Yeah, exactly. Of like colonization of Mars, yeah. right? Mars is almost inconsequential to the story. It's space and technology and distant lands are a background to a really gripping stories about like loss and internal 
internal struggles. When I said some of Brackett's stories could be inaccessible, it was in regards to how human Bradbury's short sci-fi stories are. He follows the Martian Chronicles with another Bradbury staple, a collection of store stories that is the Illustrated Man, which I was forced to read in high school, and I was very... I was really disappointed by the Illustrated Man. Yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have told that teacher I liked tattoos, and then he made me read that. <laughs> I like the Velt, though, but whatever. Um, the the Velt! The Velt! His good streak <laughs> continues with maybe his most loved classic, Fahrenheit 451, which mm -hmm. he wrote on a rental Royal KMM typewriter in the basement of the Powell Library at the UCLA. I thought he wrote in the LAPL library. He might have typewriter. switched hit, yeah. but I know he wrote he wrote some stuff. Everyone claims like he wrote it in he, the Vilt. I, <laughs> I know he he was like a problem in his life was coin operated typewriters. That was like a huge issue with him. That sounds I wouldn't write <laughs> like if, if I had to. Put a coin in every five minutes to write. I know. I wouldn't write. Writing this story is going to cost me $9.80. Yeah. Forget it. The Velt. The Velt. <laughs> but I got to put on the Velt. Seinfeld. This <laughs> book, Fahrenheit 451. I think I have Corona. I, I, <laughs> I've been slowly going crazy in my apartment. And yeah. It's, uh, it's manifesting in being rusty and also stupid. Welcome to 2020. <laughs> rusty, stupid. Okay. That's my new sci-fi character. <laughs> the, He's a Confederate soldier. Make no mistake. <laughs> rusty, stupid. The book is, of course, a landmark, a true American classic. It deals with a dystopian future where books are banned, and the man whose job it is to burn the books take a step back and ends up falling for and protecting literature. On paper, it sounds kind of lame, but I'm sure it's amazing. I remember reading it and really liking it, yeah. but I wonder if I'd still like it going back uh, to it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why people always lump that and... Um, oh, 1984? God. What? 1984. 1984, and there's a third one, but the third one doesn't deserve to be ranked together, and it's Catch-22. Oh, yeah, I never read that. Yeah. Not enough Velts. Uh, I haven't read the first 21. Anywho. I'll be lost. So uh, it won't yeah. make sense how to would, me like it doesn't for anybody. The book basically came from a lot of different ideas that he already put forth in, like, short stories. Short stories turned into a novella, and then it ended up becoming Fahrenheit 451, which, of course, I already said was on the banned book list, which, of course, makes it more, yeah. first of all, funny because the book about censorship. And then also, every couple of years, like... Oh, we have to read that banned book. It's, yeah. just, it's not smut. It's just... Make no mistake. It's not smutty like that Harry Potter. <laughs> it's not smutty like where the wild things are. <laughs> smut. So it's 1955. You're nope. in Hollywood. It's about time you get in the pictures, right? Bradbury had already done some Hollywood work. Right? He wrote a treatment for uh, It Came From Outer Space, 1953. But after some meetings with John really? Huston over the years about adapting his books, he was once again approached by Huston to adapt a film version of Herman Malville's Moby Dick. Do you know this? The Gregory Peck one? Yeah. Okay. That he that Ray Bradbury wrote the screenplay right. for. I it, can't think of it. anything less interesting than <laughs> Ray Bradbury's take on Moby Dick. Two things: Brad Baby would have to travel to Ireland to write it along with Houston, so he'd have to leave his home yeah. in Hollywood and go to Ireland to write this thing with from an intense man to write it with another an intense man. <laughs> and two, although he had a copy of the book, he was never able to trudge through you like Moby chowder, Dick. Don't you? I got a full hours about chowder. Here's the history of this particular port. He said he had so much trouble trying to read it from the beginning. So what he did did was he did what i do he opened a book to a random page in the middle and just went from there and he <laughs> ended up loving it because it turns out bradbury has a real soft spot for shakespeare of course he does but so did herman melville and apparently herman melville wrote it and after writing moby dick finally was able to read shakespeare i forget he is the reason why he never read shakespeare but was he finally like, found a copy of shakespeare like he's immune to shakespeare now because he got an inactive strand of shakespeare yeah and now dick. he actually caught it herman malville reads shakespeare and then rewrites moby dick now with ahab or like more ahab or now with more ahab <laughs> so like bradbury is reading moby dick he's like you like shakespeare like i like shakespeare and then suddenly understood a moby dick huh. but the task of that uh, should be banned ch the chapter about chowder for sure should be banned this was going to be hard for even John Houston, according to Bradbury, had either never read it or didn't understand it. So like now it was up to mostly Bradbury mm -hmm. to decipher this thing. Moby Dick for the big screen. It's not going to be a <laughs> mini series. It's not going to be like on Netflix. Yeah. Each episode is two. It's not going to be Ken Burns' Moby yeah. Dick. It's going to be a two-hour thing of Gregory Peck. It's got to be like that. Didn't matter. He took the job anyway. And it was. He said it was writing. This was grueling. Twelve-hour days, six or seven days a week for eight months in Ireland and England. It was hard brain work trying to break down and rearrange Moby Dick. How do you even begin to make that ready for the big screen? It sounded like he cracked. One morning he went in front of a mirror and was like. I am Herman Melville <laughs> and sat down and in eight hours of passionate red hot writing he described it he finished the screenplay threw it on Houston's lap and said there it is I'm done there it is take it I imagine this is like uh, you didn't see the lighthouse but no, I imagine I this is like the lighthouse it's a little bit like Tropic Thunder too which uh, is your Moby Dick which is my Moby Dick and Houston's like my god what happened and Bradbury replied behold 
Herman Melville. So yeah, working on a movie with John Hewson didn't break him, but it should have. He was <laughs> he dying to it. come back though, and he wanted to rejoin his family. He had four daughters, but at this point in his life, I think he had three three daughters at this point. So he works in TV too, writing an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. The episode is Shopping for Death. He writes like a couple more for a series, two more for Alfred Hitchcock Hour. He adapts one short story for The Twilight Zone, I Sing the Body Electric. It was one of several that got rejected. He's known more for getting rejected by Twilight Zone than getting accepted Isn't by Twilight Zone. Isn't that funny that Rod Sterling was so particular of like mm, a top sci-fi writer in the country. Yeah. Nah. nah. What How about this kid who was abused by his mom? <laughs> Charles Beaumont? Yeah, get him for a bunch of them. I was, I've been re-watching now that we're living in a Twilight Zone episode. I've been re-watching them. They have a sentimental streak, but every once in a while they do a mean thing to somebody and it's good. It's always mean. I mean, yeah, it's it's always, you know, twisted twisted irony, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm, cool. <laughs> Bill. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, book wise, was Dandelion Wine in 1957, which is a semi autobiographical look at this beautiful childhood in <laughs> Illinois. It's nostalgic and sentimental with elements of fantasy and wonder. After that came a medicine Where's for Malachi. Where's the fantasy? I, what? This wine wasn't fermented enough, but it's still good? <laughs> That's in Wine Tales. Amazing Wine Tales. After a medicine for melancholy, there's something wicked this way comes, followed later by the Halloween tree. All of these are like standard classic Bradbury names that his name is synonymous with. Yeah. And you 19- know that look that like it, his TV show had it, but like the look that almost like a lifetime movie. Yeah. Like children's movies for TV from the 80s. Yeah. Like yeah, that's, yeah. That sort of filter is what all of his books give off to me for sure yeah nostalgic and sentimental it's fuzzy a little glossy. a little bit fuzzy <laughs> like professional mullet so it's just like a perm but it's like a little bit deeper on one end than the other twisted perms in 1964 That's my magazine in 1964 he received his favorite of the many awards he'd win throughout his life when he was named the ideas consultant for the united states pavilion at the 1964 world's fair he said can mm. you believe it he would also go on to write the basic scenario for the interior spaceship at epcot disney world mm. and he also worked on the city engineering and rapid transit transit i think he was familiar with because he did not know how to drive ray bradbury pulled off the greatest science fiction trick of all time he lived in la since a teenager and did not cooperate with a you gotta get a car rule i wonder what all of his friends thought about that didn't have a car yeah. always broke going to the yeah. clifton can you cover this can you cover my limeade <laughs> mr clinton has it can you ride me back to my hovel <laughs> oh i don't have a license for my segue i like that we're just riding on him i love ray bradbury <laughs> anyways he continued to work through the years and became a well-loved literary character giving more than his fair share of speech to schools and libraries promoting literacy and showing up to book festivals yeah. and being from all appearances incredibly kind and appreciative to his fans. I, I will give him that. He seems like a really nice guy and yeah. he, he cared about people. Yeah. And he and did he, a lot for the city. He did, yeah. I'll Loved give him, him that. I'll give him that. Of I'll, all give, his I'll give one of the most famous writers of all time that. that. He also never lost his footing. Like He loved talking about like, I did this at the library. I did this because yeah. I read about yeah, it. Yeah, like, he was crazy about the library. Yeah. yeah. He would win awards all through his life. You know, He had many TV and movie adaptations of his work even like recently they redid like Fahrenheit 451 he was like involved yeah, I think he was involved with Michael that Michael B. Jordan and Michael yeah. B. Shannon <laughs> Marguerite his wife died in 2003 and Ray Bradbury himself died in 2012 at the age of 91 three years later his house he wrote many classics in 10265 Shiviot Drive in Shiviot Hills was demolished by a dickhead named Tom Main who was confused and disappointed by the public's negative reaction he said maybe I'm naive but <laughs> it's just really been a it's just really been a bummer he maybe tried to I'm make wrong but it's too late he tried to make it up we're about to be in- infected yet again don't <laughs> encourage that <laughs> Greg, you're putting children at risk, more so than usual. Tom Main, the guy who destroyed the house, he tried to make it up to the fans by having a company turn fragments of the wood of Bradbury's house into 450 sets of wooden bookends, sold for $88.50, but the money went to the Center for Ray Bradbury's Studies at India University. Why $88.50? Oh, is that the address? No, that no, 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 address. it wasn't. I don't know why that much. But then, of the money they collected from selling these bookends made of Ray Bradbury's old house, the center that they were donating to only got a portion of it. <laughs> great but bradbury's legacy isn't about a house the city dedicated the cross streets of fifth and flower to him declaring it ray bradbury square because it was close to clifton's and the central library two places incredibly important to bradbury is bradbury's legacy bigger than a cross street yeah in 1971 one of the apollo astronaut teams landed on the moon they named a crater after one of his novels they called it dandelion crater is bradbury's legacy they picked deeper the than worst a... one what they picked the worst one they picked a different one um <laughs> well, is well, his name Bur- burrow's bigger... got one on mars that's fine is le- his legacy deeper than a crater 
crater? It depends on the crater. <laughs> Ray Bradbury was a sci-fi futurist who didn't like computers or the internet, who didn't fly in a plane until late in his life. But the most important thing about Bradbury to me was his enthusiasm, his never-ending hustle, his vision, but he was a champion of the imagination. Yeah. His crusade was to get everyone to use their imagination and their creativity and make something. He wrote a great American novel on a library coin-operated <laughs> typewriter, and you could do that too, not you. <laughs> All you need is imagination and a bunch of dimes. He's a guy who has his footprint on this city. He's a guy with city folktales. When I was growing up and I wanted to be a writer since the second grade, Miss Prince Medals class, it was pushed on me that Ray Bradbury, <laughs> famous sci-fi writer, always went to the library. He always read. He always wrote. He did it, and you can do it too. That's Ray Bradbury's legacy. And he was a son of the city, albeit a, an adopted son. Ken Starr says it best in Golden Dreams, California in the Age of Abundance, 1950-1963. In short, like Los Angeles itself, eclectic and unintimidated, and an entertainer who whom highbrow critics took seriously, a self-educated urban planner respected by professionals and a jack of all writing trades, Bradbury was, in short, a latter-day Jack London for Los Angeles and doing all this without the benefit of a driver's license. <laughs> That's Ray Bradbury's story. Uh, yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but dandelion wine. I rest my case. Dandelion wine. 